I would hope and anticipate that with the weight of the Hague certification name behind them and what that means and what they'll learn that that means, uh, that they're going to be getting someone who is as, um, you know, w way more prepared and way more knowledgeable in the basics, um, that that will mean those people will get preferential treatment as well. That is our goal. In this video, learn why getting your own training as an independent adjuster is crucial for your success and how Hague Education can provide you with high quality training and knowledge that you can not only use to get preferential treatment from IA firms, but more importantly, that you can use right away at the desk and in the field. And finally, get a behind the scenes look inside the lab at Hague Research and Testing and learn what happens to that roofing shingle when you send it for a forensic engineering assessment. Stay tuned to the very end to get a valuable discount code for most anything on HagueEducation.com, including books, tools, certifications, and training. Starting now. This is Adjuster TV. Hey, Matt here with Adjuster TV, and for the best tips, tools, and training for becoming a first call adjuster, subscribe now. If you want to help this channel, hit the bell notification so that you never miss a video. Adjuster TV is brought to you by Paysetter Claim Service. Learn more at AdjusterTV.com slash Paysetter. E&O provider Kaplik, download the free insurance for adjusters guide at cplic.net slash adjuster TV. Adjuster Pro, get your first license now at adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro, US tape and Eberl claims service. Apply now at eberls.com. Thank you to all our sponsors and to everybody who watches and supports Adjuster TV. You are the best. You know what's also the best? Gravy is the best. Coming up, why you shouldn't rely on free IA firm training or worse, on the job training. I mean, would you trust a surgeon if her first surgery was on you? I am Casey Merchant. I work for GRS, uh, Global Risk Solutions. It's an independent adjusting firm. Uh, we're based out of Sarasota. I am the, right now I'm kind of working on recruiting, always recruiting adjusters and people to our roster and kind of building that up as best we can. The best part about NACA I think has been for us is kind of meeting all of these people that are enthusiastic about getting into the into the industry and excited to see where that takes them. And yeah, just the personal connections with them and also seeing people that we've worked with in the past, uh, the longtime adjusters with 30 plus years of experience coming together with um, and learning and helping teach and grow the newer adjusters. I'm Matt Anderson, founder, CEO of Phil Pros Direct. So Phil Pros is similar to your traditional IE firm or a TPA in a lot of ways, but what makes us different is we were founded as a technology company and the very first uh, iteration of our platform, the problem we're trying to solve is some of the pain points of the way adjusters receive claims, the way adjusters are able to uh, you know, choose the types of claims they prefer to handle. So that was their, uh, really the first iteration of our technology platform. But we, we took that and really evolved into more of a technology-enabled service company rather than just a technology company. And now we're you know, doing a lot of TPA work, a lot of IE work, and a lot of other insured tech type uh, claims things on the periphery. We attend NACA for, for the adjusters. Uh, with this being a COVID year, we uh, you know had some questions, should we attend, will we attend, but when we heard how many adjusters would be here, uh, how much our team wanted to see and interact with the adjusters, uh, we knew we had to attend. But also, um, you know, we, we're growing, so we have lots of new opportunities for adjusters, but it's also a good opportunity for us to get feedback from adjusters of you know what could we do better, what could the industry do better, but uh, we do attend a lot of conferences, but this is the best one uh, to, to meet and interact with adjusters, which is you know, in so many ways the, uh, the, the core of what we do. For an adjuster, I don't know, know if there's any other place where you, they can connect with so many different uh, adjusting firms in one place or kind of sources of work for them. Uh, so I think it is a really good opportunity to, in one place, adjusters meet with a lot of different companies, understand what's different between one and the other. Um, so I think it's great in that aspect. Um, also, the the, uh, the continuing education or the uh, the, the classes I think are, are very beneficial as well. But it's probably the best conference for adjusters and the adjuster community to network and learn more about uh, what what IE firms are out there and what IE firms are doing.
For discounts on lodging, gear, training, licensing, and CE, as well as one-on-one -on -one mentorships, join NACA right now at NACATADJ.org. And of course, the convention is an outstanding place to network and one of the best places to interview with dozens and dozens of IA firms all in one place, all in one week. I'm Nick Shrewsbury, EVO Program Manager for Paysetter Claims. We're looking for talent to work with Paysetter's new EVO program to evolve our claim systems to the next level. Adjusters working with the EVO program will have the advantage of being able to run claims for almost all of Paysetter's family of carriers. Our EVO platform allows adjusters to work independently of carrier estimating programs and criteria. In addition, EVO adjusters are supplied an easy to navigate mobile app a hover standard on every file, better work-life balance due to the writing and settling of the file being handled by our internal team. No estimating subscriptions are required, no carrier policy knowledge is needed, and adjusters will also enjoy the benefits of a competitive pay structure over the industry standard. If you are interested in learning more about the EVO program or joining our growing team, please contact us or apply on our website. My name is Justin Kessner. I'm the CEO of Hague Global, the president of our subsidiaries, including Hague Engineering. My name is Ryan Holdhues, and I'm the vice president of Hague Education. I've been with Hague since 2002. Next May will be 20 years with Hague, so I'm very proud of that. First longest place I've ever worked. My name is Jim Cheney. I'm director of curriculum and senior instructor with Hague Education. Been in the insurance industry for 27 years now. Hague was founded back in 1924. We're the country's oldest company that's focused on failure and damage analysis. So we have our flagship forensic engineering group, our construction consulting group, our education group with its one-of-a-kind phenomenal certification programs and other courses, research and testing, which has been doing ice ball impacting, building envelope and other testing for over 50 years, fire investigations, and we also have other specialty technical services including GIS, laser scanning, drones, etc. When I was in the field, you know, there was, a, there was a definite lack of training. You know, it was sink or swim, they would throw you out there and you'd figure it out. You, you rode with other adjusters and you learned what you could from them. And the, the, the problem with that is they taught you what they knew, but not everything that they knew was correct. The Hague Certified Reviewer Program uh, is an extension of our Hague Certification overall kind of brand, um, which started in 2007 with our Hague Certified Inspector Program, which was deliberately uh, designed for field adjusters, roofing contractors and roofing um, consultants as well, who are out in the field looking at damage on roofs. Um, that's been very popular since 2007. Uh, we've, we started that in 2007. 2009 came our Hague Certified uh, Inspector Program for Commercial Roof Inspectors, and then in 2014 our Hague Certified Inspector for Wind Damage Inspectors. So that was basically building envelope, foundation all the way up to the roofing structure. The training that Hague has is very much uh, things that the adjuster needs in the field. Uh, that's our certification training. But the industry's changing. Uh, not all of your adjusters are in the field. More and more of your adjusters are going inside where they're not out there doing the inspections. So for those adjusters that are still out there doing the inspection, we have our Hague Certified Inspector courses. Before I came to Hague, I had taken every course Hague had. And, but they just didn't have that, that certification level that was so complete. And now with this inside reviewer, because the industry's changing and the, a lot of adjusters just don't qualify, they don't have the experience for our HCI program, we've created and we're in the process of creating this inside reviewer. And that's for the desk adjusters that may or may not have any field experience. They may have never written an estimate. They may have never been on a construction site. 
and that part of the industry is growing by leaps and bounds. Our Hague Certified Reviewer Program uh, is now um, starting to roll out. So level one certification of, a, of the Hague Certified Reviewer Program is uh, basic construction. So we talked all the way through the construction of, of a residential, uh, as a re residential structure. Once you complete that, you move to level two. Um, and by complete that, I mean you have to complete a, a comprehensive exam that is proctored, and then you are level one certified. Level two is then damage assessment. This time it's a little bit different. Our focus is on the desk adjuster who might be looking at photographs and notes from a field inspector, and that's all that they've got. So we're, we're teaching it from that perspective, not telling them what to look for in the field, but telling them instead what to look for in the notes. And if it's not there, encouraging them to go get more information so that they can make the correct decision. We're not just talking about roofs and, and exteriors anymore. Uh, we go inside the house. We talk about mold. We talk about water damage. Uh, we talk about um, uh, fire and smoke damage, that sort of thing, interior stuff, which we really had also left out of our curriculums in the past. You move to level three, which is estimating. One course that everybody has to take, and that's the basics, uh, principles of estimating, and then uh, the, then you can choose your track. Do you want to take Xactimate or do you want to take the Simbility track? And you can choose one or the other, or you can take both, all for the same price. It does not involve uh, or include an Xactimate certification per se, but it is taught by an Xactimate certified instructor. And then you complete the level three uh, Xactimate track. If you want to move on to the Simbility track, or if you only want to take the Simbility track, you can do that as well. The same way we brought in um, a Simbility expert to, to teach the course that was co-developed for us with uh, CoreLogic. They put the course together for us, um, and then uh, our instructor put it together. So these are people that we brought in from outside Hague that have true estimating um, uh, experience in those individual platforms. There will be a comprehensive exam, and once you complete that, then the level four, which we're calling the advanced level. The neat thing about level four certification in HCR is that um, it's, it's going to be filled with elective courses. You have to uh, complete a minimum of 12 hours to get the certification, uh, but if there are 25 hours or 24 or 30 hours of training in there, you can take it all for the same price. And once you complete it, you're level four certified in the Hague Certified Reviewer Program. Over 20,000 people now have been through the Hague Certified Inspector Programs, all three of them combined. Um, it's been a very popular program. It has kind of set the uh, benchmark as far as damage assessment is concerned in our industry. It's recognized on the contracting side. It's recognized on the insurance side. Um, major insurance carriers require Hague certification if they work with independent adjusters in many cases. In order to give them uh, give uh, independence uh, roofing work, they have to be Hague certified. I can speak for my experience with the Hague Certified Inspector Program that IA. For IA firms that are usually being um, um, uh, encouraged by carriers uh, to have Hague certified inspectors on staff. I, I do have a, a pretty strong understanding that if people who are Hague certified uh, will get preferential treatment with that. I would hope and anticipate that with the weight of the Hague certification name behind them and what that means and what they'll learn that that means, uh, that they're going to be getting someone who is as, um, you know, w way more prepared and way more knowledgeable in the basics, um, that that will mean those people will get preferential treatment as well. That is our goal. After the break, get an inside look at the top secret lab at Haig Education in Flower Mound, Texas. As an independent adjuster, do you feel like you only have bad, expensive choices for health insurance plans? And when you have to use the insurance, you'll have to pay a lot out of pocket? Makes you wonder why you even have insurance in the first place. The stakes are high. Having no coverage puts you and your family at risk. It doesn't have to be this way. You want peace of mind with common sense health coverage you can count on that doesn't include things you don't need. You need real insurance with world-class protection from established carriers, not health sharing and not cobbled together prepaid medical. And you shouldn't have to wait for it. Get approved in days, not weeks. There is no risk and no cost to see if you qualify for these high quality plans. Not everybody will qualify but you've got nothing to lose by getting a free consultation. Visit adjustertv.com slash health for more information and to apply. This is Adjuster TV. My name is Steve Smith. I'm the director of Hague Research and Testing Company, uh, HRT. Um, I've been with Hague for over 23 years. When you get a hail assignment, um, it, it's a puzzle. 
you know, and, and you, you don't know from the beginning if there's hail damage there or not. You just know you have an address, maybe a storm date, and you're going to go try to figure out what's going on. You don't start off by jumping up on the roof. You, uh, maybe you drive around the neighborhood, look at some transformer cabinets, take a look at some, some fences and maybe some alleys or whatnot. Then you get to the house or the, 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 the business or whatever you're, you're looking at and, and you look at the exterior. Uh, you're, you're trying to educate yourself on how big was the hail, when did it hit, uh, what direction did it come from, and, and finally you know, you've got some of that information. It's almost like cheating on an exam, right? You have that in your back pocket before you even get up on the roof. Then you go to the roof and, and you're looking at more things, all right? Uh, vent caps and flashings and then the roof covering itself and you're looking for, you know, obviously for what dam you know, what, what areas are damaged. You might be looking at things that might be mistaken for damage, uh, but you already know information on size and direction of hail. You're trying to put it all together and usually that's enough, but there are times that you put all the puzzle pieces together and there's still a couple of pieces missing. And that's where lab testing really comes in, especially on the commercial roofing, because you might, you might see something that, gosh, it might look like damage from hail, but it, you know, maybe not really, and maybe you didn't see any evidence of hail big enough to cause that damage, but you're not sure, cut a sample out or obviously have a roofer cut it out, patch it, send it to the lab, have us take a look at it. There's lots of things that we can do. Maybe you know the thing you're looking at is absolutely hail caused, but you don't know is it just coating damage or does the damage go through the whole roofing? And that matters with respect to how do you make the repair. And so the lab can also do artificial hail testing. We can shoot that roof with different sizes of artificial hailstones, frozen solid ice balls, at the velocities that hail of those sizes are going to fall. And we can show you what does hail damage look like to that particular roof from a particular size and tell you what's the smallest hail that can damage that roof. And when you get those puzzle pieces together, you can have confidence that when you put your ultimate report together, your decision together, you're gonna to be accurate. Because if the hail size that needs to damage a roof doesn't match up with what you find during your inspection, doesn't match up with what you uh, have researched on the weather side, you've got a very strong case that it's not hail damaged. On the other hand, you might find laboratory testing, weather research, and your field inspection absolutely corroborates, and you know it's hail damage, and that can justify writing a big old check for a new roof. So the lab testing is a vital role when you're trying to finish up that puzzle. We do the Underwriters Laboratory 2218, which is a steel ball drop. It's one of the older uh, impact testing standards out there. There are four classes of steel balls. Uh, inch and a quarter is class one, inch and a half is class two, inch and three quarters is class three, and, and two inch is class four. Um, all four of those sizes of steel balls are dropped from four different, si uh, four different heights so that when the ball impacts the target, it is impacting at the same kinetic energy of a similar size hailstone. Even though the steel hits the roofing product at the energy of, an ice, uh, of a hailstone, the physics don't exactly match that of, of a hailstone. And uh, what was noticed is that, you know, roofing products that are flexible in nature uh, tended to do relatively well with the test. And superior products, when I say superior, I'm referring to hail resistance, such as a concrete tile, uh, a roofing slate, a clay tile, for example, maybe even some synthetic products, weren't performing as well. Um, even though in real life they do great against hail, they're just not very steel ball resistant to get the industry to accept the ice ball impact testing. They wanted to deviate from the steel ball testing as little as possible. But HRT, we, we, we can perform them both. This is the AccuDrop. This is uh, something that Haig uh, has put together to fulfill a test called the UL2218. That's Underwriters Laboratory 2218. It's basically a steel ball drop, and you've got four different classes, inch and a quarter, inch and a half, inch and three quarter, and two inch in diameter. And here we have our uh, 
are steel balls for one of each of the different classes. Uh, we will be performing the class four, which is two inch. Uh, the way this machine works is that we, we go ahead and pressurize the, uh, the inlet tube here. We'll select the size, in this case, a class four. We'll put the ball in the chamber. And when we open the valve, that's gonna lift a piston closing off this hole and there's an opening in the bottom of the piston that still allows the air pressure to shoot up the line and that's going to lift the ball all the way up to the top and over on the other side and as you see each of these drop tubes has uh, effectively a bucket on top and inside that bucket is a very specially designed a cup if you would and the opening in the cup is precisely manufactured so that when the ball lands in that area, it, it can't immediately go through the drop tube. Instead, it's going to circle around as it loses momentum until that ball comes to a complete stop. Once that ball comes to a complete stop, it'll then be able to drop down the tube and it's going to land on the sample where the uh, laser is pointing. The reason we do that is we do not want the ball to have any momentum going into that tube. This is a drop test. So the ball needs to stop before it drops. And then based on the class level, there's gonna be a specific height. In this case, class two, a 20 foot drop. It'll drop 20 feet exactly onto the sample. And then we will repeat that process one time so that we end up with two drops at the same location twice. All right, well, we have our, uh, our two inch class two ball. We have uh, the target location set up. We're gonna turn on the blower, take the ball. There we have our impact right where the laser was pointing and then we'll do that second impact so that we get two at the same spot because that's what the standard calls for. Then we can pull the panel out and we can actually look at the damage and you can clearly see this did not pass a class 4 impact. And we can see the, the fracture on the back side so it clearly ruptured the shingle. We like to take a product test and then use it in a forensic way and of course one of the things that the hail industry or insurance industry has really run into a lot uh, in the last several years are situations where hail will hit a single ply roof, uh, PVC, TPO, EPDM, and not damage the roof, but it would dent the insulation. And of course, you have a perfectly good roof with dented insulation, and the question is, hey, what do we do about this? Do we ignore it? Do we rip off the whole roof and replace all the insulation just because there's a dent? Well, why do we care about dents? Well, there is the thought that the dent is gonna reduce the insulation value, the R value of the insulation. And that's a real concern, right? I mean, you don't wanna laugh that one off. If, if you're gonna have you know, huge increases in your air conditioning, refrigeration, heating costs because this hailstorm dented your insulation, that's important, it's something you should know. So what we did at HRT is we purchased a heat flow meter. It's a, it's a cabinet, it's computer controlled, it has two plates inside the cabinet. We develop a really nice differential temperature across the two plates. Obviously the bottom plate doesn't move, but we move the top plate to put uh, on top of the sample. And we can put an insulation sample in the machine set the parameters, close the door, lower the plate, and run the test. Once the test begins, uh, these numbers, the temperatures are being, you know, uh, analyzed by the computer, and once it hits a steady state uh, condition, uh, the, uh, within the parameters, the, the testing starts. 
And so it takes a reading, and then 10 minutes later, it takes another reading, and 10 minutes later, up until five consecutive readings are, are taken that are all within the same steady state thermoparameters. Then things get worse. Those parameters are then shrunk down to a really, really tight tolerance, and then five more readings are taken 10 minutes apart. And if all of those parameters fall within the, the correct range, then the test completes and the computer uh, uh, churns out the thermal resistance of the insulation. But then we can also measure the R value of insulation that has a hail dent. We can take a non-dented piece of insulation from the roof, maybe uh, it was sheltered by a wall or from a, a rooftop unit or something, and then take another piece of insulation that has a hail dent, and we can run both of those one at a time and compare them or if you can't find a non-dented insulation, uh, we can measure the R value of the dented insulation. We can add an additional dent the same size as the dent that we're measuring and see if that additional dent had any effect. A really interesting point is that the, the area within the heat flow meter that does the sensing, does all the measurements, is four inches by four inches. But in the industry, we don't deal with four inch by four inch areas. We deal with test squares, right? 10 feet by 10 feet. You know, the, the smallest number of dents that we can analyze is one, right? You have one dent. Well, one dent inside a four inch by four inch square is equivalent to 900 dents in a, in a test square. And what we have found is a hail dent, even a pretty good sized hail dent in that four inch by four inch area has almost no effect, none. Um, we'll, we'll compare the, the initial dent to the non-dented or to when we add one additional dent and those two readings will, will differ by less than 1% and that's as sensitive as this equipment can even measure. So it's basically not even measurable having 900 hail dents per square. And I've seen roofs with more than 900 dents per square, but I'm telling you, that's a pretty good hailstorm, right? That's a lot of hail dents. And so our lab can actually take insulation samples in the same way we'll take roofing samples, and we can run an analysis based on the number of dents, the size of dents. We can take these thermal measurements, and we can give you the science whether or not there is a measurable loss of R value uh, for that particular insulation with the hail dent. Yeah, this is our heat flow meter. We use this to perform ASTM C518. And uh, so here's the heat flow meter itself. Uh, this computer is controlling the heat flow meter and we have an out output on the, uh, on the screen here. Uh, what you're seeing, this blue line is gonna be the temperature of the lower plate. The red line is the temperature of the upper plate. And so we set those at two opposing temperatures so we can establish a differential temperature across a piece of insulation. Uh, that purple line is the, the, the median temperature that it's uh, currently reading. So this, this is gonna run for probably an hour and a half or two hours, and then it'll be able to give us the, uh, the readout of the, uh, of the R value. Uh, give you a quick, a quick peek of what's inside here. So as you see uh, underneath, well here we have the insulation. Underneath here we have that lower plate, that's the, uh, the one giving us that blue line. And then here's the stack, which is the upper plate, and, and that would be the red line there. And so the machine is gonna be able to read the, uh, the thickness of the insulation. Obviously it's reading temperatures. It's also taking uh, heat flux readings. And so when, again, when the, when the test is all done, will have an, uh, an R value for that insulation. Coming up, learn what a shingle desaturator is and also just how much wind can a shingle handle. Being a claim adjuster can be a rewarding experience, helping people during a time of need. However, that experience can quickly turn in the form of claims or lawsuits made against you. Facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage, you are putting yourself at great financial risk. Don't stand alone. Let Kaplik stand with you. 
At Kaplik, we provide financial security and peace of mind through our insurance products designed specifically for the independent claim adjuster. What makes Kaplik unique is our industry-leading expertise in providing guidance, risk management, and support to reduce your risk protect your reputation, and maintain client relationships. Unlike other insurance providers, our coverage is straightforward and easy to understand, tailored exclusively for claim adjusters and insurance service firms. Our in-house expertise and experienced staff understand the nuances of the adjusting industry, a difference you'll feel and understand from the moment you contact us. After all, Kaplik was founded and continues to be run by independent adjusters. Just like you, we handle everything so you don't have to. From individual adjusters to national leaders, Kaplik is there for you. With Kaplik, you're not just a policyholder, you're an owner. Kaplik is member owned and member run, which means that you get a say in how we best serve you. If you make your living as an independent claim adjuster, stop paying for generic or inadequate coverage that may not fully protect you. Join the Kaplik family for a personalized experience. Premiums start at surprisingly affordable prices for all of the coverage you need. For a fast quote, apply online now at www.cplic.net slash apply. Desaturation is probably our, our most common test that we do. Uh, we get all kinds of, of uh, bituminous roofing in um, just to see if the reinforcements are, are damaged. There are definitely techniques you can use in the field to determine if there's, um, if there's damage on a mod bed roof or a built up roof, uh, but um, uh, sometimes you want that extra assurance of, of confirming the presence or absence of damage to the reinforcements. What our technicians do is they, they take the, the samples, they fully document them, they weigh them, they measure them, they photograph them. They produce what we call an overlay. It's just a clear plastic sheet they put over the sample, they trace around it with a Sharpie. Any areas on that sample that look like they could potentially be hail damage, they'll also mark with the Sharpie on the, on the plastic. And then they set that aside for later. They uh, physically examine the samples, they feel them for bruises, they look at top and bottom, take close-up pictures, uh, you know, maybe bend them just a little bit just to see if there is a fracture, does it open up. Uh, they take the sample and they put it through a machine called a vapor degreaser. And what that machine does is it, it, it takes a solvent and it heats it up uh, to, it vaporizes it. You have a, a cloud of solvent vapor that is then condensed back into liquid vapor, uh, liquid solvents. So you have hot, clean liquid solvent that we collect in a tank, and then we pump that over onto the sample, and that hot, clean solvent dissolves all that asphalt or modified asphalt, and after four, five, six hours, what you end up with is, is a set of reinforcements that are perfectly clean. We put that overlay back on there. We know exactly what orientation it was, and now we have a road map to show us exactly where were those areas that we thought may have been damaged by hail. What is very counterintuitive, but what we find is a, a larger fracture at the bottom reinforcement and smaller fractures, or sometimes no fractures, higher in the sample. The reason that is, is when hail hits, uh, say, a built-up roof, there's, there's flexing uh, at that point. And on the very top surface, you have a compressive force. You know, built-up roofs are pretty strong in compression. But on the bottom, you have a, a tensile force, a pulling force, and, and that tensile force, it tends to rip the sample apart. So you get a fracture in that base, base sheet. And then the next layer up, you get a smaller fracture, and the next layer up, a smaller fracture, and maybe you even run out of fractures. Maybe it doesn't go all the way to the top. But after desaturation, if you have that characteristic ever so smaller fracture as you move up through the sample, you know that's from an impact. There's nothing else that does that. The way this system works, we have a basket that's currently lowered in there, and the basket is what we attach the samples to, and so that hot, clean solvent goes right over those samples, and it dissolves the asphalt, the, the bitumen, on those samples, and it all drains back into this dirty tank. So we end up just cycling this hot solvent, and after a few hours, 
all of the uh, bitumen is dissolved and that gives us reinforcements that we can look at. So currently, obviously, we don't have any samples in here, but we'll hang the samples from the rungs, the, uh, the, the solvent pours out of the rungs, the basket with the fabric here catches granules and little gravel or whatever falls off the samples. We can take these nice, big, thick, built-up roofs uh, that we're trying to find out if there's hail damage to them or other samples like this modified bitumen roof. And after those few hours of operation, we can turn these types of roofing into their reinforcement. So in this case, this is a, from a kind of a hybrid uh, built-up roof, mod bit roof. It's basically a built-up roof with a, a mod bit cap sheet on it. And so you can actually see the cap sheet reinforcement. It's sort of a polyester style reinforcement. And then with the built-up, you end up with uh, several uh, fiberglass plies and in this case, it also had an organic type base sheet. Now this particular sample has been damaged by an impact and the desaturation procedure has uh, presented that to us. If you look, uh, we really don't have any fracturing of the cap sheet and that's very common because these polyester cap sheets are super, super strong. But then when you get down into the meat of the, of the sample, you see these fiberglass reinforcements, they are actually fractured. And if you look at the fracture in this top ply, it's a it's pretty good size fracture. But then as, as you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the sample, you'll see that these fractures get larger and larger. You know, I, I mentioned earlier today that the damage to this type of roof actually initiates on the bottom and it moves to the top. And here you see our organic base ply has the largest of any of those fractures. So it kind of shows that, uh, that bottom up um, damage that occurs within these roofs. And then here's an example of an asphalt shingle. In this particular case, it's been hit by a golf ball size ice ball during our testing. And you can see here that after desaturation, you can clearly see the fracture in that fiberglass reinforcement. You know, before this went into the machine, it was, it was a full shingle with asphalt and everything. The wind machine itself is designed to perform ASTM D3161, which is a test that puts a wind classification on roofing products. Uh, historically, that uh, standard was made to uh, test asphalt shingles but um, revisions to the ASTM were made to really include all roofing products or all not membrane type roofing products, but shingles and tiles and things like that because the, 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 the principles are the same. You're, you're throwing wind at a panel containing roofing products that are installed in accordance with manufacturer's instructions. And so uh, it generates, uh, has a big motor uh, blow, uh, w uh, that drives a blower and then that air is thrown down a duct, which then converges uh, to put very high speed wind out of the end. Uh, we've got three pressure tubes. Uh, each one feeds a transducer, goes to the computer. Computer uh, has a program to convert everything into a wind speed, and then it tells the motor to speed up or slow down based on whatever speed we, we set it at. It could be used by the book to provide one of three classifications, uh, 60 mile an hour, 90 mile an hour, or 110 mile an hour rating. When you're doing a forensic examination, you don't really care, well, okay, what's the rating of this product? You want to know how much wind can it take before it fails? Well, on a forensic sense, you know, we would set it at kind of a minimum speed and then put a gradual ramp on it and then just watch and see what happens. The standard requires you to actually video it so that when a failure occurs, 
numbers, you can actually look and see exactly where does that failure initiate, what was the speed of the wind when that condition uh, occurred. You actually can feel it. You know, when that machine gets over 100 mile an hour, you can you can you can feel that. Hey, there's something going on in that room over there. Yeah, this is the inlet side of our wind, wind simulator. Uh, air from our laboratory gets sucked in through this ducting, so the air comes into our blower and then it sends it into the, the ducting that sends it down towards the sample. Yeah, this is the electric motor that actually drives the blower. And then here we have our variable frequency drive that tells the motor how fast to go. Okay, so we have three keel tubes equally spaced in the wind stream per the uh, ASTM D3161. Uh, each one of these, when wind blows on it, it produces a stagnation pressure, which is then transferred through these tubes over to our pressured transducers. And so here we have our three transducers that are calibrated annually, and then they communicate with the computer that's in the control room on the, uh, the other side over here. Here is our, uh, our control room for the wind machine. You see here, Corey is gonna do our, our operating today. Uh, we've got two computers, one that uh, specifically controls the wind simulator, tells it you know, how to ramp, what, what speed to ramp to, how long to, to sit at whatever level. And then the other computer is really here just to capture videos. We, uh, we take several video feeds, a top down, sideways, and then a, a, an oblique view. Uh, so that when we run the test, if there is a failure, we can actually show exactly where the failure occurs and what speed, the, the, uh, the wind speed, uh, when that failure occurs, which is according to the, the test standard. Okay, so we had a test of the uh, asphalt shingle panel. Uh, clearly, uh, prior to the test, the shingles were well sealed. They were totally glued down. As the wind increased, uh, the stagnation pressure underneath the butt end of the shingle got high enough to where it broke the bond. So they broke the bond of a shingle, lifting the tab. And so as the tabs kind of flapped in the wind, the uh, speed of the wind was continuing to increase, ultimately tearing off shingles from our test panel and sending them out our door. And coming up, meet the IBL-7 and his big brother, the IBL-9. What does IBL stand for? Ice Ball Launcher. Fire in three, two, one. Plus, why tech isn't erasing our jobs anytime soon. Get long measurements with the best, most durable tapes for commercial and industrial use. That means you, Adjuster. Use code ADJUSTERTV at checkout for a discount on anything at ustape.com. This is Adjuster TV. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster. But you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York. Make sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get 
and maintain your Adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters, and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjusterpro right now. We've been doing uh, simulated hail impact testing for a long, long time. Our, our first hail launcher was uh, dated 1963, and uh, we, we were one of the, the pioneers with respect to actually doing hail testing on roofing to determine you know, what, what does hail do, what does it not do, what does it look like, what does it not look like. Um, we've gone through numerous generations of, of hail launchers. Um, the, the one that we use most frequently now, uh, we call it the IBL-7, it stands for Ice Ball Launcher 7. You know, engineers aren't known for their cre creativity, uh, but uh, that, that's what we named it, that's what we're sticking with. What makes it so special is that um, most of your artificial hail launchers um, use pneumatics. They use air pressure to throw uh, an ice ball down a barrel onto, onto a you know, roofing product or what have you. The IBL-7 doesn't use air. It uses uh, latex tubing. And the reason we switched to the latex is because it's extremely repeatable. Shot after shot after shot, we're almost always within one foot per second. A lot of the, um, the pneumatic tools, you could have a spread, four, five, six foot per second spread. And, and when you're trying to be really precise uh, and repeatable on your, on your speed and your targeting, uh, you, you want something that uh, will give you those reliable uh, results. The only real drawback to the IBL-7 is that it does have a limitation on size. It can shoot anywhere from a half inch hail up to two and a quarter inch. Uh, but sometimes we need a test bigger than two and a quarter. So when that happens, we, we bring out the IBL-9, uh, which uh, is a pneumatic tool that can go up to four inches. It's, uh, it's a beast. You know, our goal is to produce a worst case scenario impact because uh, uh, we, we deal, you know, our engineers, our inspections, we, we oftentimes use the term threshold. That's the, the threshold size of hail to cause damage. You know, what's the smallest hail that can damage a particular roof? And in order to answer that question, you need hard hail, they frozen solid ice. And uh, on top of that, we want to hit it at that perpendicular angle. So we've got the super hard hail hitting it at just the right angle. And if we can't damage it with those two things combined, then we know we need to move to the next larger ice ball. My name is Corey Herchibes. I'm a lab technician at Hague Research and Testing. So this is our IBL-7. It's used to shoot half inch to two inch ice balls. It's latex band driven. The latex bands are pulled back into place and then launched, the ice ball will propel. It's laser sighted at the, imp at the sample. IBL-9, we use it to shoot two inch to four inch ice. It uses compressed air to drive, propel the ice ball out of the barrel. We have different barrels to fit in different ice ball sizes. It has a calibrated gauge that will measure the pressure once the correct pressure is achieved. We have our launch button that will propel the ice ball to the impact. The main concept is it'll use compressed air. It does have an actuator with the butterfly valve connected to it. So that way when I hit the launch button, the butterfly valve will open, allowing all that compressed air to shoot down the barrel. That ice ball is right in front of it, so until it leaves the barrel, it's accelerating. Then once it leaves, it's at its velocity that will be for the impact. So one half mv squared, we have our velocity, we have the mass of the ice ball so we can calculate the energy. Um, and that's the same concept for the, for the IBL-7 as well. 
Uh, so nothing changes for that, and we'll measure every velocity for each impact and every kinetic energy for each impact. decades and decades, thousands and thousands of, of roof inspections and so we, we combine the information our engineers gather with the lab testing that our technicians uh, put together and uh, we, we, we publish our, our research papers that, that talk about what is that minimum size of hail to cause damage uh, at you know, obviously at the perpendicular impact angle. So let's talk a little bit about um, AI powered drone uh, based roof inspections. I've been involved in some cases and, and some research studies uh, for some of those companies, helped them with their R&D by, in effect, uh, ground truthing it, so to speak. So, you know, what is the drone picking up based on its 4K photography and, and really, I mean, really great photographs that they take and using their artificial intelligence uh, what are they picking up and calling as hail damage or even wind damage versus what are we finding when our trained uh, engineers go up on a roof and are inspecting for, for bruises, punctures, and other uh, actual hail damage. So what we've seen so far is that uh, the majority of the ones that we've studied overstate what the actual or potential hail damage is. So you need to be careful and uh, certainly if you're finding um, you know, thousands of, of hail damage locations on a roof of uh, you know, moderate size and you look at the weather data and, and we'll get into weather data in a minute, but uh, you, know, you really still want to ground truth those in, unless it's obvious. If you're in a neighborhood and you, you've seen baseball hail go through there, um, like it has not too long ago, a couple miles from my house, and you just want to fly the drone to verify it without having to get on the roof, save yourself some time, yeah, great use, great use of it. But when you're getting on the fringes of where uh, the really large hail fell, and um, you're, you're at or getting even below threshold sizes for what causes hail damage to, for example, asphalt shingles, then you really need to take these uh, drone reports with a grain of salt. And I highly recommend that you still go up on the roof, at least a portion of the roof, and, and verify what you're seeing is real. Because oftentimes, uh, for ones we've seen, and I've been retained as an expert in a case um, just like this, areas um, of just premature granule loss, pattern granule loss, even nail pops coming up through the roof, uh, scuff marks from you know, inspection and maintenance activities and all. Um, anything that doesn't look like a nice even shingle mat has the potential to be flagged as, as damage and they'll show up as, as circles, for example, in some of these reports. So again, you really need to have somebody on the roof to verify those as you're getting in the uh, fringes of these areas or, or where they're questionable because I've seen reports um, and compared them to photographs that uh, inspectors have actually taken on the roof and you're seeing areas like this big and, and it's pretty obvious that's just a pattern of granule loss. Uh, and, and other if you had an area that big that was caused by a, a single hail impact, you know, you'd expect the, the shingle to be punctured, not just bruised. And the inspectors weren't even finding it bruised. So there's still that human element that's needed. Um, I have no doubt that these these programs, um, the artificial intelligence will continue to get better and someday we very well could be there where you can have high, high confidence in what they're finding. 
what we've been seeing the last several years, we're not there yet. Let's talk a little bit about these um, meteorological reports that are algorithm based on radar signatures and things like that. Now, I am not a meteorologist, though we do have three meteorologists on staff who are also engineers. Those still need to be uh, ground truthed based on signatures of hail. Uh, dents on metals, spatter marks uh, where hail removes oxides and dirt, you know, within the past two years to verify recency of hail dents and so forth. And we've also have uh, at times found that these algorithm-based reports, which are proprietary, so nobody actually knows the algorithm, that sometimes they overstate the size of the hail that actually fell at a, at a site. We've seen sometimes where they've even understated the size of the hail that fell at the site. And we've seen sometimes where um, hail didn't fall at all recently, um, no spatter marks left at least, and they said that hail of a certain size had fallen. These reports are based on radar data that is, you know, thousands if not tens of thousands of feet in the air. And so it's, it's documenting, you know, maybe kernels of, of water or hailstones that are up in the clouds, but it doesn't mean they actually fell to the ground at that size over that location. And so our meteorologists can take a deep dive at that. They can actually see how far away uh, the, the radar stations were from the site and compare all that. And of course, they can also go to the site or compare what our engineers or construction consultants' findings were at the site in terms of spatter marks, dents, and all that to give you validation that yes, hail of this size fell at the site, or no, the hail was actually larger or smaller than that. And similarly, with uh, wind speeds, you know, you, you need to ground truth it, and you need to look for the collateral indications of wind damage, not just the roof, but you know, awnings, satellite dishes, gutters, downspouts, lightly fastened components and cladding that are easily damaged uh, compared to uh, certain types of roofing. And so you just got to keep all these things in mind when using these different technologies that are out there. Well, I think what you're going to start seeing is some of these technologies uh, packaged. And I think we're already seeing that uh, for some underwriters are doing that. Um, so BetterView, for example, they go through and they pull a lot of publicly available data or membership available subscription-based data and, and the, you know, satellite images, weather data, different things like that. It's pretty slick in um, basically giving a risk rating to properties uh, to help with the underwriting. And I think you're going to start seeing that on the adjusting side as well. So maybe, for example, you'll get reports um, by CoreLogic or others for wind and hail events there, coupled with um, you know, drone imagery and whatnot. And um, maybe at some point uh, there'll be shared claims databases and things like that. So the technology is changing at a, at a rapid pace, but with any new technology, you know, there's going to be uh, improvements uh, that need to be made, you know, two steps forward, one step back kind of thing. And um, there's brilliant people out there programming this, but the thing is, uh, I would say to you is, if for decades, two people arguing over hail damage at a roof right at their feet, uh, if they're not gonna see eye to eye, are they suddenly gonna see eye to eye because a computer told them so? I don't think so, but I think what all these can do is hopefully speed the process up. I really hope you enjoyed this Adjuster TV special presentation. If you did and you got something valuable out of this video, won't you hit the like button? It really helps Adjuster TV grow. Oh, and about that coupon. If you visit HagueEducation.com and use coupon code ADJUSTERTV at checkout, you will get a valuable discount on just about anything that you can find there, including the Hague Certified Reviewer Certification, as well as their other trainings and certifications, these sweet books and these sweet tools. Thank you so much for watching and have a great storm. This is Adjuster TV.